This meeting is being recorded. Good morning. I'm pleased to call to order the 271st meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council in Foster City, California. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during the meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and provide the council with comments on issues before the council at this meeting. Please note that the webinar chat feature should be used only for technical issues and not to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on the April council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed for the person in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please submit them in electronic format to the electronic portal when you sign up for testimony. Written comments must relate directly to your oral testimony to be accepted at this stage. After you speak to the agenda item, the comments will be posted and made part of the official record of the meeting. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recordings will be available by contacting the council office, or you may purchase audio recording copies from the meeting recorder, Mr. Craig Hess. Let me remind council members and others to speak directly into your microphones so that all may hear. Lastly, I ask that all council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on their cell phones and mute your connection while the council meeting is in session. I'll now ask our executive director, Mr. Merrick Burden, to call the roll of council members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, council. I will now call the roll of the 271st session of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, Heather Hall. Here. Phil Anderson. Here. Um, let's see, do we have uh, Michael Clark or Benjamin Cross? Uh, absent. Robert Dooley. Here. Brett Edinger. Here. Danny Evenson. 
Present. Mark Gorelnik. Here. Dave Hansen. Dave Hansen is not present. Pete Hassemer. Present. David Hogan. It's not present. Virgil Moore. Here. Lynn Mattis. Here. <clears throat> Joe Oatman. Here. Brad Pettinger. Here. Corey Ridings. Here. Butch Smith. Here. Krista Svensson. Present. Ryan Wolf. Here. Marcy Uremko. Here. And that concludes the roll, Mr. Chairman, and you have a quorum. All right, thank you very much. So before we get started, we have to have an agenda. Oh, uh, there is there is an agenda in the briefing book, and I'll look for a motion. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Waiting for my motion to come up on the screen here so everyone can see it. Thank you, Sandra. I move that the council approve the council meeting agenda as printed in agenda item A3, April 2023, which includes the strikeout of agenda item E7, Southern Resident Killer Whale, Chinook Threshold, and other fishery management plan clarifications scoping. All right, thank you. The uh, agenda on the, the language on the screen appears accurate and complete. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. Please speak your motion as you feel necessary. Uh, I think it's clear. It's a All right. great agenda. We're going to have a great week. All right. I'm not seeing any hands for discussion, so I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. We have an agenda, so we have something to do this week. So uh, next, uh, uh, we'll, I'll call on our Executive Director, Merrick Burden, for his report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is agenda item A4, the Executive Director's report. Uh, the Executive Director's report to the Council typically provides information on informational reports, changes to Council membership, advisory body, and committee alternates that are in place for the current meeting, activities of staff and council members that have occurred since the last meeting and other updates not announced elsewhere that may warrant summarization. Um, as I indicated at the last meeting, my new practice is going to be to provide you a, a written report. Uh, there are, because of our briefing book timing, there are some things that have happened since the report that I will summarize verbally. So starting from the top of this report, um, we are continuing to provide COVID protocols uh, per usual, those are contained in the general information portion of your briefing book packet. Uh, in your briefing book, you have several informational reports, uh, one including a notice from NOAA Fisheries uh, with a proposal to list the Sunflower Sea Star as threatened under the ESA. There's a trawl rationalization compliance summary. There's an Office of Law Enforcement Enforcement Priorities Report. We received a uh, report concerning NOAA's West Coast Geographic Strategic Plan and also included is a obituary for Ms. Uh, Michelle Longo-Edder, um, someone who is very important to this community. We have a chair's reception planned for this evening, uh, 6 p.m. It will occur right out here in the uh, foyer area out in front of the ballroom. Uh, let's see, moving forward, we do have several advisory body alternates uh, listed there in the table. A few additional alternates came through uh, after this report was placed in the briefing book. Those alternates are, let's see, on the SAS, uh, Mark Newell is sitting in place of Dara's Peak. And on the ground fish advisory panel, we have Chris, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this, Chris Sawin, Sawin, sitting in place for Paul Moranti. Uh, let's see, continuing on. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of things happening with the Council Coordination Committee. Uh, between now and the next meeting, we will meet in Key West. Uh, the Gulf Council is the host this year. Uh, the chair, vice chairs, myself, and our deputy director will attend. Uh, 
one unique aspect of this meeting is that there will be a special meeting of the deputy directors, which uh, does not happen very often. Um, there's been quite a bit of change in the deputy directors across the councils. Uh, a lot of the deputy directors are uh, sharing information on uh, operations and uh, lessons learned, and that will be the focus of their meeting. Also one item to note, uh, the CCC's area management subgroup has been hard at work. Uh, they've been pulling together a mapping exercise that documents all of the conservation areas implemented by the regional councils throughout the US. Uh, that mapping exercise is going to be complemented with a journal article that should be submitted later this year. I don't have a hard uh, date in mind, <clears throat> but uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is underway and in the works. And also of note, uh, NIMS has been undertaking a similar exercise and uh, recently requested, and we have granted to them the data that we compiled, uh, that, that the councils have compiled for this exercise for NOAA's usage. So what that tells me is that we should be singing the same tune regarding uh, conservation areas that have been implemented through fishery management measures around the country. So that concludes my executive director's report. Mr. Chairman, I am happy to take any questions. All right, are there any questions on the ED report? All right, thank you very much, Merrick. Uh, that'll take us to our next uh, agenda item, which is open public comment. Um, I know that we have a comment uh, from Greg Bush from the Office of Law Enforcement. Are you with us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the council. My name is Greg Bush. I'm the Assistant Director of National Marine Fisheries Service Office of the Law Enforcement West Coast Division. And I'll be speaking briefly on Information Report 3, Request for Comments, NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement Priorities. NOAA Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement formally updates its enforcement priorities every five years. OLE's draft priorities for FY23 through 27 are included in Information Report 3. This draft was developed with input from customer and partner agencies and is now available for public comment through April 17th. The enforcement priorities are broken down by division and categories, which include sustainable fisheries, protected resources, IUU fishing, and international treaties and programs, seafood fraud, wildlife trafficking, and national marine sanctuaries and monuments. OLE will review comments and post the final approved version of its enforcement priorities document on its website later this spring. Thank you and I'll take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Are there questions of Greg on the Office of Law Enforcement report? Thank you very much. We have uh, four folks who have signed up for public comment. We'll get those names up on the screen here in a moment. And the first speaker is Harrison Ibach. Harrison, are you with us? You're unmuted on our end, so. Well, we'll come back to Harrison. I'm sorry. But there you are. Welcome, I'm Harrison. Sorry. I apologize. I won't take up too much of your time here. Um, <clears throat> I just really wanted to say uh, quickly that, um, you know, I've learned from a young age that saying please and thank you can go a long way in life. And uh, the non trawl fleet had asked to gain more access and opportunities into the non trawl RCA and the cow cod conservation areas. And this was the fleet saying please. And uh, after years of hard work on behalf of the council staff and National Marine Fisheries Service and state agencies, um, the council delivered. And at the last council meeting in March, the council took final action and adopted the non trawl sector area management measures package. And uh, now it's our turn to say thank you. And as evident in the briefing book public comments on non-agenda items, uh, it's quite apparent that the West Coast fishermen are 
very appreciative of the work of the council. Um, and th this may be trying times, you know, in the fishing industry with the closure of the salmon fishery. Um, but however, the, the opportunities that this package provides um, obviously does not go unnoticed. So um, quickly on behalf of the non trawl fleet, I'm here to just say thank you for your action. All right, thank you very much, Harrison. Appreciate that. Any questions of Harrison? Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Harrison. Um, I don't have a question for you, but I just want to say thank you in return. Um, opening up the briefing book and finding 40 unique comments um, from throughout the commercial non trawl sector, I think all the way up um, into Oregon and down into Southern California was really remarkable. And um, I just appreciate you've all taken the time to um, have your uh, representatives, your um, advisory body representatives and um, local uh, senators and um, leaders of various organizations uh, provide uh, comments to the council expressing uh, the importance of the action that we were um, taking last uh, last March. So, um, or last meeting rather. Anyway, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, this was an outpouring of support and it was just a, a pleasure to read. Um, so thank you again for the efforts to organize um, letter writing campaigns. It's great to, to hear from members uh, from small boats, large boats, um, bigger operations, small and um, throughout uh, the California coastal communities. So um, just much appreciated. Thank you, Harrison. All right, any further questions on Harrison's comment? And I see any hands. Thank you very much, Harrison. Next, we'll hear from Jamie Diamond. Jamie? Good morning, Chair Grelnick, Council, uh, and staff. Um, I am Jamie Diamond, Vice President of the Sport Fishing Association of California. And I, like Harrison, um, on behalf of my fleet, would like to thank the council and staff and advisory bodies and all of the people that had their hands on uh, the, the non-trawl uh, action back in March, as well as the C especially for us in the Southern California area, the CCA action. Um, it is going to, to have a, a, a pretty significant impact on quite a, quite a few members of our fleet. And um, so I just wanna thank everybody on behalf of, of my constituents. Um, and I know that this has been a long time coming and I know a lot of different people along the way have been part of this action. So uh, we just wanna offer our, our thanks and gratitude to everybody for this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jamie. Any questions for, or comments for Jamie? All right, thank you very much. Robert Cranky, followed by David Bain. Robert? Thank you. I, I guess I'm pretty lonely here. <laughs> Everybody else does this online. I'm not too good at that, things. Anyway, um, again, I wanted to echo Harrison's uh, appreciation for opening more ground fish opportunities. I'm a small boat fisherman over in Half Moon Bay locally here, fish for Dungeness crab, salmon, and rockfish. Um, I, I participated briefly in an experimental permit with the long leader to stay off the bottom to catch chilies and um, yellowtails, bokachi, things like that, or more in the water column. And uh, it's going to be, couldn't come at a better time with, we've had a pretty bad crab season in this area. We had faced with a late opening that really hurt our markets. And um, for the Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's thing that frankly is the bulk <laughs> of our income. Uh, now the closure of salmon fishing is just the final blow. So it's gonna be a lot of participation in the ground fish fishery, which I've done for many years, me a lot of new participants. What I'm here to talk about, and I don't mind to make this as like a whining or complaint, but I think there's room for improvement on the uh, newly instituted ground non-trawl ground fish logbook. Um, 
you know, we live in an electronic age. Look around us. We see all these computers, laptops, things, stuff. And, you know, some of it I really embrace. Some of it is not too friendly for a lot of us. Um, the other thing with this logbook thing is now, um, as fishermen, we're asked to collect real-time data, essentially aboard our vessel. Some of us fish in, like, center console open boats were our only electronic device other than our seal electronics that we use for navigation and fish finding are our cell phones and they're generally in our locked glove box so they don't get destroyed i recently dropped my phone into standing water and had to buy a new thousand dollar phone which is not very fun and losing a lot of data um, the request i guess is to look at another means of collecting this this very detailed data about our catch I mean, we, we all fish in federal waters with VMS. So, you know, we're pinging fifth. You know, I think it's every 15 minutes now. So there's really real time data where we are. Our landing receipts definitely denote what species we're catching, how many pounds. Um, our area, which is a block number, which admittedly is pretty large and vague. Um, anyway, back to the real time data collecting. Um, We've all tried to use the cell phone or something with wet fingers. It's plain doesn't work. Um, it, counting paper um, logs and stuff, we can we can do. It's not ideal, certainly. And then we have to, at the end of the day, I guess, have another burden when we're tired and just want to go home and have a shower and eat dinner or something, filling out more forms. Um, and I, I'm really kind of puzzled as to why such a need for such detailed information. We all take observers for a two-month period every year and there are our hands-on data collector and that's fine you know i have a very good relationship with our guy kevin i mean i invite him for dinner at my house and stuff even and so it's not we're adversary to observing or anything it's um it's just an additional burden um oftentimes this rockfish there's a very small window like two hours a day when they're really biting and i mean i fish by myself and it's on my only hand, all hands on deck, and I'm literally hopping from the front of the boat to the back of the boat, undoing fish, putting them on ice, trying to catch more. And um, it's just something I don't think that provides the really any useful information that isn't gathered in other places. And so um, maybe someone can get back to me in the future and we can come up with a solution of maybe a, a simplified log or something. I mean, hook spacing, number of hooks used, things like that. I mean, I have to understand in the management practices, it's really how much we're taking out of the ocean is what you council uses for a management tool to um, set quotas and stuff. And I'm really thankful. I mean, our quotas have gone nothing but upwards. And uh, again, like I say, it couldn't happen at a better time basis based on the challenges we're, we're facing this year. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say, and uh, thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much, Robert. Questions for Robert? Marcy Remco? Hi, good morning. Thank you for testifying here today, and thank you for joining us uh, here at the table under open comment. Um, I guess my, my first question for you, um, it sounds like you're using the logbook um, the requirement took effect in January, so it sounds like you have some experience with it on the water. And maybe I didn't quite catch if you're using the electronic version or if you're using the paper version. And then my next question is, have you um, been in touch with uh, Dan Platt or Harrison Eibach? Um, both are the open access reps on the GAP that have been assisting in the development of the logbook program and the trials associated with uh, the testing of the form. So um, maybe we can hear about that. Sure. Um, frankly, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I've not used it yet. I'm just going on information. Others, I know I haven't spoken with Harrison, but the few I've talked to um, were very frustrated with it. And um, I know someone who has direct input to Harrison and he's made several comments to Harrison. So um, I've fished inside of three miles so far, so it has not been a requirement. Um, this time of year is through water conditions of temperature and water clarity or something I found is not the most productive time for me to do bottom fishing. Um, we, we got stopped on crab fishing, so that's coming to a halt here real quick. Um, 
Anyway, so I don't speak from personal experiences. I'm just relaying experiences that others have voiced to me that, that um, don't feel like making public testimony. So I will um, get in contact with Harrison. He, he sounds through a guy I know is the, the point of contact probably, and maybe at the gap or something, I guess it's all virtual this time. It's not in person. So um, I'll try to participate in that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further questions, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Robert, for testifying. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I live in Half Moon Bay. Yeah, I, I recognize your name. Yeah. <laughs> you have some very large so vessels. <laughs> please uh, contact me. Okay. And let's get together, have a cup of coffee, and I'll do sure. my best to tell you what I know and okay. point you in the right direction. But I appreciate you coming forward. Well, Thank I you. appreciate that invitation. All right, any further questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, have a great day. You too. All right, David Bain, uh, you are up. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. David Bain. I'm Chief Scientist for Orca Conservancy. Uh, we're a Seattle-based nonprofit uh, with tens of thousands of members around the world. Uh, we work to conserve uh, killer whale populations worldwide, uh, but our focus is on southern resident killer whales. Um, new information available since the adoption of Amendment 21 suggests it needs to be updated to prevent Chinook harvest from jeopardizing the recovery of southern resident killer whales. Amendment 21 was intended to prevent population decline. Under the Lacey et al. model, maintaining prey availability was expected to sustain a population of over 75 whales for about 100 years. However, the population has already dropped to 73. Southern resident population dynamics are correlated with range-wide prey availability from Central California uh, through British Columbia and some years to Southeast Alaska. While Amendment 21 is intended to maintain prey availability in the north of Falcon portion of the range, the collapse of runs in California mean more fish will be needed for southern residents in the north of Falcon area uh, due to lesser prey availability in California. Third, a recent paper on inbreeding suggests the population will continue to decline even with constant prey availability, rather than remain fairly constant as predicted by Lacey et al. Further, the increase in inbreeding depression over the last generation suggests that the prey availability in the baseline period is no longer sufficient to sustain the population, even if um, inbreeding alone would not result in decline. We urge the council to update the threshold set in Amendment 21 in light of the new data. In the meantime, the quota for North of Falcon uh, should be set in accord with the lowest alternative. In addition, we suggest the council develop a process to shift harvest riverward of where Southern residents feed. This would maximize prey availability to the whales while minimizing the impact on fisheries. The new data on inbreeding suggests that action to recover Southern residents is urgent. Managing fisheries is one of the few means available to immediately benefit southern residents and minimize increases in inbreeding depression until habitat improvement projects, such as removal of the Klamath River dams, substantially increase overall prey availability. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bain. Questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, that concludes all of our open comment. We have no action, no discussion here. So we will move without further ado to our next agenda item, which is C1 Habitat. And I will hand the gavel off to Vice Chair Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Grolnick, and good morning, everyone. And with that, I'll uh, turn to Kerry to start us off on uh, C1. Kerry. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
This is agenda item C1, current habitat issues. Uh, the Habitat Committee met this weekend and is still meeting right now um, and um, talked about several items, including CPS EFH and Klamath and Sacramento uh, Chinook uh, salmon habitat indicators, the Klamath River dam removals, and some other items. There is a supplemental report that's in your briefing book, and um, we have Corey Green here who will read the report. So that's my overview. Okay. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, questions for Kerry on the on the, the the overview? Okay, not seeing any. We'll turn to the Habitat Committee and uh, Corey Green. Corey, my check. You're good. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Council. I'll be reading Agenda Item C1A, Supplemental Habitat Re Committee Report One, uh, Habitat Committee Report on Current Habitat Issues. And so we have three. The first one is NIMP's biological opinion on pesticide impacts on salmonids and critical habitat in Oregon and Washington. The National Marine Fisheries Service published a draft biological opinion for two widely EPA registered agricultural pesticides and concluded that continued use of pesticides containing carbaryl and methomal are likely to jeopardize the continued existence of 30 listed species, including 18 to 22 ESUs or DPSs of listed salmonids, Chinook salmon, coho salmon, sockeye salmon, and steelhead. In the Columbia, Willamette, and Snake Rivers, as well as Central Valley Spring Run Chinook, Sacramento River Winter Run Chinook, California Coastal Chinook, and Southern Oregon, Northern California Coho. These pesticides are also likely to destroy or adversely modify their critical habitats. Carbaryl and methomal are insecticides commonly used on field vegetables and orchard crops across the Willamette Valley, the Columbia River Gorge, and southeastern Washington. The NIMPS draft biop is open for public comment until May 15th. Because of this tight time frame, which would require a quick response letter, and the complexity of the issue for which the Habitat Committee would have to seek help of, from outside expertise, the HC does not recommend a letter, but would like to highlight this issue for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council and its stakeholders. The HC noted that most Chemical toxins affect individual fish health and populations through protracted and convoluted biological processes. There may be cumulative impacts as well, considering the 21 other EPA registered agricultural pesticides that receive a jeopardy determination, that received a jeopardy determination in prior NIMPS biological opinions over the last two decades, as well as from other stressors. The result is a reduction in fitness that can have consequences for fish population performance such as increased vulnerability to disease and predation, pre-spawn mortality, and homing ability, that is the jeopardy standard likely to cause extinction for which reasonable and prudent alternatives are developed is uh, a relatively low bar. These RPA conservation measures, such as application setbacks, rates and frequency, use of vegetative strips, and ditches necessary to avoid jeopardy may not prevent harm to fish or habitat or to humans, especially communities that consume relatively more salmon than others. The next item uh, we discussed is Oregon House Bill 3382. The HC has identified a state bill that may be of interest to the council. Oregon HB 3382 authorizes ports at Astoria, Newport, Coos Bay, Portland, and St. Helens to construct, maintain, and improve deep draft navigation channel improvements without demonstrating compliance with state or local land use law. This would apply to activities located within or adjacent to a federal navigation channel or on land controlled by a port having property interests served by channel improvements. If successful, this bill will deepen the estuaries, potentially significantly reducing rearing habitat for coho, chinook salmon, and shellfish. As explained in joint written testimony by Oregon Natural Resources Agencies, such as the Department of Land and Conservation and Development, Division of State uh, Lands, and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, to the Oregon Joint Legislative Committee on Transportation, this bill could affect the state's authority to implement the state's Coastal Zone Management Program and Coastal Zone Management Act Federal Consistency Authority. The bill could also undermine 
Oregon's statewide planning goals and local land use regulations. In that testimony, ODFW expressed concern that the bill could affect the delisting of Oregon Coast coho salmon. ODFW believes there is a high potential for delisting in the next five-year status review scheduled for 2027 due to successful management actions implemented under state and federal conservation and recovery plans. This would be the first time NOAA Fisheries has delisted any salmon or steelhead from the Endangered Species Act because of recovery. The state is concerned that the bill may jeopardize NOAA's confidence in Oregon's ability to provide perfection, protections for salmonid habitat thus jeopardizing the delisting of Oregon Coast co coho salmon. The H. Lee believes the bill would also set a bad precedent to allow special interests to waive land use regulation review. The final item is salmon passage at Chief Joseph Dam and Upper Columbia River. The H. Lee received an update on the efforts to introduce salmon to the previously blocked area above Chief Joseph Dam on the Columbia River uh, by Casey Baldwin from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. In 2020, the council provided a letter of support for the Upper Columbia United Tribes for this effort with a request for a regular updates. UCUT has completed phase one of this project, which included a scientific phased approach to modeling habitat availability and suitability, stock options, and salmon survival. UCUT has moved on to phase two, which is implementation, implementation of pilot projects, monitoring, evaluation, and adaptive management, design and testing reintroduction strategies, and evaluating fish passage facilities. Phase two is a roadmap on how they intend to implement the reintroduction, starting at the dam furthest downstream and working stepwise upstream. They are establishing access to sources of non-ESA Chinook and sockeye salmon stocks and testing key assumptions around life cycle modeling. During this process, they began moving fish above the dams for cultural and educational releases to address short-term tribal goals. They've had successful harvesting and educational events providing a proof of concept. They have released uh, greater than 1,500 adults and 16,000 juveniles in areas that have not seen salmon in 70 to over uh, 100 years. While the HC acknowledges that there are many issues and concern around quality and quantity of habitat, predation, and infrastructure in the Columbia Basin, we support the reintroduction effort and applaud and appreciate the update. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, um, <laughs> questions for Corey on the Habitat Committee report? Okay, I'm not saying any. Thank you, Corey. And uh, there's no reports, and I believe there's no public comment, which takes us to uh, council action, which is to um, consider comments and recommendations developed by the Habitat Committee. So with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to, this is actually more of a, a comment, just um, thank the Habitat Committee for um, looking into this biological opinion, just bringing that to the council and the council family. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a new issue for folks here, but I think it's important that we are continuing to think and discuss and hear about that from, from the Habitat Committee. So just wanted to um, voice that appreciation. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, with that, I'll turn to Carrie. Carrie, how are we doing on this? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think you're doing fine. There were no specific requests or recommendations, and so um, this was more of a discussion and informational item. So uh, if there's no further direction, then that uh, concludes your business on this agenda item. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, with that, that will take us to uh, City Calumet in D1. And with that, I'll turn to Robin. Is she online? We might want a little quicker than that. Pause for a second. Yeah, we'll just pause for a second here.
Okay, we're back on uh, D1, Pacific Halibut. And with that, I'll turn to uh, Robin to uh, start us off. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D1, the incidental catch limits for the 2023 salmon troll fishery final action. Uh, we're revisiting this topic. We started in March with three options. And today we're going to ask the council to adopt the final landing restrictions for the Pacific halibut that are caught in the incidental non-tribal salmon troll fishery. Uh, this will be uh, for our salmon regulations coming up starting May 16 and continuing through the end of the year into the salmon troll fishery and then um, starting up again April 1 in 2024, unless they're modified uh, through in-season action. Uh, under this agenda item, um, for your reference material, you do have the attachment one, which outlines uh, what the harvest has been, the allocation has been, and the um, uh, restrictions on landing limits that have been used in the past. And then we also have an advisory body report uh, from the salmon advisory subpanel. And that concludes my summary under this agenda item. Thank you, Robin. Questions for Robin on her overview? Okay. So with that, we'll turn to the SAS. Right? Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We'll read the um, SAS report on incidental halibut catch limits for the 2023-2024 salmon troll fishery. The SAS recommends the following catch limits for final adoption. Option one, open May 16, 2023, through the end of the 2023 salmon troll fishery and beginning April 1, 2024 until modified through in-season action or superseded by 2024 management measures. License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement, no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. That concludes the report. Hey, thank you, Ryan. Questions for Ryan on the SAS report? I think you're good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It takes care of the, oh, we have one public comment. Oh, all right. We'll have them pull it up here. All right, Joel. That on there. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, members of the council. Thank you for giving me the time to State, my name is Joel Kalahara. I'm a salmon troller from Quilcene, Washington. I want to speak in support of the SAS dis, uh, decision for the incidental halibut in the troll fishery. I, it's uh, actually pretty economically important for us nowadays. Salmon are, uh, there's fewer salmon, of course, and trip limits are small, and all the, all the additional income we can get is very welcome. So I fully support this move, uh, this program, and uh, that's all of my comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Uh, questions for Joel on his public comment? Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment, which takes us to council action. And so uh, we do have to have some action. So with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Or a motion. <laughs> Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. I do have a motion for this agenda item. Okay. I move the council adopt the option one catch limit for the 2023 salmon fishery as described in the supplemental salmon advisory subpanel report under agenda item D1A, April 2023. That is option one, open May 16th, 2023, through the end of the 2023 salmon troll fishery and beginning April 1, 2024 until modified through in-season action or superseded by the 2024 management measures. 
License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut or two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Looking for a second. Second by Butch Smith. Thank you, Butch. Okay. Heather, please speak to your motion as needed. Yes, thank you. I think um, the SAS has discussed this and, and reviewed the allocation uh, this year, which is very similar to last year. This option reflects status quo from the uh, landing ratio that was adopted for the 2022 season. Um, this can be amended through in-season action if uh, the allocation is projected to be reached before the end of the salmon season. And um, so I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Anyone else? The discussion for the questions for Bushmaker? Um, Marcy Renko? Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, believe you said we're in discussion. Thank you. Um, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, Heather. Um, just wanting to flag that um, I'm looking forward to additional discussions about the catch sharing plan that will be uh, occurring uh, in our advisory body arenas here. Um, already is underway, started back in March. Um, I'm noting that um, attachment one of our materials uh, um, as shown um, since 2020, um, the incidental um, catch of salmon or halibut in the salmon fishery has, has not attained its uh, allocation under the catch sharing plan. <coughs> and I'd also note that uh, the rollover provisions that exist from the directed commercial fishery can roll into the salmon troll fishery as well. So um, I don't think that's happened in a while, but um, just things to think about as we're looking forward and thinking about longer term um, changes that might be in order for our catch sharing plan so that we can work collectively to ensure that we attain our area to ATAC. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? All right. Well, seeing no hands, um, I'll call for the question. Then. So, um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. <laughs> Abstentions? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. You made quick work of this halibut topic, and I believe you've uh, finished uh, everything you needed to do. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Um, well, we're moving quickly to the agenda here. So um, next up will be E1. And Robin, I'll turn back to you again. <coughs> okay. Okay, we'll just wait here for a little bit for get the seats uh, moved around a little bit. So. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. I think we're ready for uh, E1. Robin. Thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. This is uh, agenda item E1. Uh, we have the National Marine Fisheries Service report. And under this agenda item, we'll hear from uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and the West Coast region and the Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers. Um, they'll just uh, give us an update on anything that's been happening relevant to salmon fisheries. Um, no real action uh, for the council under this agenda item. It's uh, just a matter of uh, discussion. Uh, you do have a NEPS report under this um, item. And we have, I believe, Susan Bishop here to uh, brief the council on NEPS activities. Okay, questions for uh, Robert on that overview? All right. With that, Susan, welcome. So. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be speaking to agenda item um, E1, um, NIMS report, and also supplemental NIMS report E1B. Um, my report will be very short. Um, most of the items of interest to the council were covered in our report in March. Um, then the, the only thing I have to add is that we have officially um, reinitiated consultation on California Coastal Chinook um, and are beginning um, to work on the new biological opinion there. Um, otherwise, I would just draw your attention to the supplemental NIMS report, which is um, a category or a list of um, science publications from each of the Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Centers on topics of interest to the Council. I'm happy to ask or answer any questions. Um, questions for uh, Susan? Okay, um, I guess any public comment? <laughs> I don't see any. For what? <laughs> okay. I guess we have. Yeah. We'll get it pulled up here shortly. Okay. For public comment, we have uh, Brian McLaughlin. Brian, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, we sure can. Thank you. Chair and council members, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I fish primarily out of the Port of Garibaldi. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments regarding recent regulatory actions by the National Marine Fishery Service. I hope I've uh, selected the right agenda item for this. On March 10th, NIMS, in consultation with the Council in the states of California and Oregon, closed commercial and recreational salmon fisheries south of Cape Falcon through at least May 15th. NIMS took this action due to the need to conserve impacts on Klamath River, Fall Chinook, and Sacramento River, Fall Chinook. One of the fisheries closed was a recreational fishery from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, which was scheduled to open March 15th. I personally participate in this fishery. I recognize that low abundance forecasts this year for both Klamath and Sacramento Fall Chinook warrant extraordinary measures. And I don't mean to be insensitive to the extremely harsh realities, both social and economic, of no salmon fishing at all for commercial fishers south of Cape Falcon 
and for recreational anglers in California. Yet I'm disappointed that NIMS decided to close down the spring falcon to humbug recreational fishery because my understanding is that expected impacts to Kalamath and Sacramento Fall Chinook in this area during this period are minuscule and would have likely no material impact on achievement of applicable conservation objectives. My reading of preseason report two tables A2 and A4 indicate that the conservation benefit of closing the falcon to humbug area to recreational salmon angling from March 15th to May 15th amounts to an estimated savings of seven Kalamath Fall Chinook and no more than 13 Sacramento Fall Chinook. With a Kalamath uh, abundance estimate of over 100,000, that amounts to an exploitation rate impact savings of seven thousandths of 1%. For Sacramento Fall Chinook with an abundance estimate of over 169,000, the exploitation rate savings amounts to eight thousandths of 1%. And even if Sacramento abundance estimate was buffered by 40% to account for recent over forecast, the expected impacts would only be around 1.3 hundredths of 1%. I don't understand how these minuscule impacts provide a rational biological basis to close for two months, 215 miles of the Oregon coast, encompassing the ports of Garibaldi, Pacific City, Depot Bay, Newport, Winchester Bay, and Coos Bay. Angler effort for salmon in this area during the spring is very modest, and our catch numbers are low, measured in the hundreds of fish, not thousands. But it's still disappointing to lose recreational opportunity where the impacts are so very minimal and closing the fishery doesn't seem required to meet the conservation objectives. Based on these figures, I'm left with the impression that the decision to shut down the falcon to humbug area to recreational salmon angling this spring appears to be more about optics than actual conservation benefit. But if my impression is mistaken, if my understanding of the expected impacts, abundance estimates, and allowable exploitation rates are off base, then I invite NIMS to explain in detail with reference to these specific figures, why shutting down specifically the falcon to humbug fishery was needed to meet conservation objectives. Finally, if the council intends or rec uh, to recommend or if NIMS and the Council are, for practical purposes, developing management measures designed to satisfy lower allowable exploitation rates than those prescribed in the applicable control rules. Preseason reports should have clearly indicated this to provide notice and allow stakeholders to comment on any such modifications to the conservation objectives. Thank you for considering my comments. Thank you, Brian. Questions for Brian on this testimony? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Brian. Okay, that concludes public comment. It takes us to uh, council action, which is um, council discussion, if need be. So with that, I'll open the floor for, for that discussion. And if there isn't any, I'll turn to Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, you've completed your work under this agenda item. Thank you. Okay. Very good. And with that, um, I think that's the fastest three items I've ever done in my life. But uh, with that, I'll pass the gavel back to uh, Chair Grelnick. It just demonstrates your development of skill with a gavel. <laughs> And with that, I'll pass the gavel to Vice Chair Hassemer, who may have an announcement. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, I think we're going to start this off with a break. Let's take 15 minutes here so everybody can organize their thoughts. And we'll be back at, what time does that give us? 10.15. So we will break. The recording has stopped.
This meeting is being recorded. All right, thank you all. I think we're ready to begin again. I uh, thank the previous gavel holders for giving me ample time to complete this agenda item today. So I will turn it over to Robin to start us off. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item E2, the tentative adoption of 2023 management measures for analysis. Uh, so you remember back in March, we adopted three salmon management alternatives. Uh, we published those in the preseason report two, which is available electronically on our website now. And then we also sent those alternatives out for uh, public review. Uh, we held our three uh, public salmon meeting that the council hosts, and we'll hear from uh, the council members that attended those, a uh, summary of what they heard at those meetings. Um, we'll also look to narrow those three alternatives down to one management alternative so that the STT can run their analysis. And um, we also have some other information to provide under this agenda item. Um, we'll speak a little bit to uh, the uh, discussions through the North of Cape Falcon uh, Forum. And we also have um, some reports over the uh, PSC that uh, we'll hear about and uh, discuss any uh, new information that's available since we last met in March. And um, also under this agenda item, there is um, some information regarding uh, emergency uh, rules, um, which may come up as we develop these fisheries. I don't necessarily think, think that that is the case at this time, but if so, uh, there is information there uh, for the council to review on what the steps would be uh, if that were the case. Um, nonetheless, by the time we get through this agenda item, we'd ask that the council adopt uh, 2023 ocean salmon, salmon management measures for analysis uh, by the STT. And then the STT will return on uh, Monday to um, provide the results of that work. Um, for reference materials, we do have uh, a bit of a list uh, to walk through. We will have uh, three reports. Well, we'll start, I think, with the uh, STT. Uh, they'll give a report on what has changed since March. We will also hear from, uh, the, again, the council representatives that attended the uh, public hearings hosted by the council. We have three reports there. We also have a, PC, a PSC report that will be provided by uh, Phil Anderson. And scrolling down my list, we will also um, hear a little bit uh, from uh, the co-managers uh, north of Falcon on uh, what kind of work they've been doing since uh, our March meeting. And then um, we have a CDFW report, um, the SAS report. We'll have the SAS come up and um, provide their uh, recommendations for this salmon season. And we have uh, two tribal reports, one from the Colville tribe and one from the Columbia River tribe. And I think that wraps up the information that you have uh, under this agenda item. And so that concludes my summary. Thank you, Robin. Are there questions on this agenda overview before we begin? I don't see any questions, so that will take us directly to the STT report, Dr. O'Farrell is here to deliver that. Good morning, Dr. O'Farrell. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Uh, I will be referring to agenda item E2A, Supplemental STT Report 1, uh, STT uh, Update of Estimated Impacts of March 2023 Alternatives. Beginning on page one, um, just note that uh, the changes that have occurred since we left the March meeting 
Um, we have now updated northern fisheries, a CTC catch limits for Alaska and British Columbia in particular. Um, we have 2023 forecasts for all stocks, uh, including Canadian stocks in the Oregon coast. And uh, we have 2023 starting packages for Puget Sound uh, fisheries. And now I'll, I'll go through um, some of the highlights of Table 5. Um, as you will see that for the first time um, in this process, we show Puget Sound um, uh, uh, exploitation rates and so forth uh, for uh, three alternatives that we left pre-2 with. Um, these weren't in um, the uh, March Council meeting because we hadn't had the inside packages. And now uh, we see that uh, there, there's a number of bolded uh, numbers here, but that's not unusual for this stage of the process. Moving on to the next page, um, note that uh, for Lower Columbia River natural tules under alternative one, the exploitation rate exceeds 30, uh, 38%. Um, in this case, we're using 2022 preseason inside numbers, um, but this does uh, reflect the the new uh, northern ocean fishery numbers. Okay. <laughs> Moving along, um, there's been no changes uh, to the California um, impacts um, from the March Council meeting. Moving on to Coho on page four. Um, we see here for in, uh, Interior Fraser, Thompson River, Coho, that all three alternatives meet the um, objectives. Um, that was a result of good forecasts that lowered the exploitation rates. Um, and uh, we do see that of, under all three alternatives, uh, Skagit is not meeting um, that exploitation rate ceiling, but uh, um, we expect inside shaping to um, continue this week. Um, for the Washington coastal stocks, uh, there are 2022 uh, terminal inputs uh, being used as, at the current time. And uh, for Lower Columbia River Natural um, uh, Coho, um, we're still using pre-season pre 2022 inside exploitation rates. And that's the end of table five. Uh, table seven um, with, has the breakdown of exploitation rates in different areas uh, for LCN Coho, OCN Coho, Lower Columbia River, Tule Chinook, as well as Sonk Coho on the second page. So that um, concludes my summary of the um, STT's impacts uh, uh, following the uh, March Council meeting and the updates that we've received since then. And I can try to address any questions uh, you might have. Thank you. Questions for Dr. O'Farrell on the STT report. I don't see any questions, so thanks again, Mike. Thank you. Next, we will move on to the summary of the public hearings that were held, and we'll start in the north again. Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. There was a public hearing held in Westport, Washington on the evening of March 20th um, to take public input on the salmon alternatives for the Washington portion of the coast. Representatives there included myself as the hearing officer, Mr. Jeremy Jording from National Marine Fishery Service, Lieutenant Junior Grade Connor Sutton from the Coast Guard, Marlene Bellman from the Council Staff, and Dr. Alexandria Safik and Kyle Vandegraaff from the Salmon Technical Team. Um, Mr. Phil Anderson and Mr. Butch Smith were also there for the Council. It was a pretty typical hearing. I provided some opening marks, just a broad overview of the outlook for this year, and that was followed by a detailed review by Kyle Vandegraaff of the alternatives and their impact um, for the commercial and recreational salmon seasons north of Falcon. We had eight people testify. Um, the president of the Washington Trollers Association provided comment uh, generally in support of Alternative 1 and highlighting the importance of the of the larger quota this year for the communities of the Washington coast um, after some years with some leaner quotas. 
there was um, written comments submitted through the um, council website that goes into details of the testimony that he provided there. And we had seven people testify about the recreational um, fishery. Again, general support for alternative one, the quotas and season options presented there. Also um, considerations that if we wind up on lower quotas as we move through the week, that there may be a need for a more conservative approach to preserve seasons out there. Um, wrapped up the evening with Mr. Anderson providing some reminders that we were still waiting on some important pieces about fisheries to the north, which as we heard from the STT, those have now been incorporated into the modeling. We'll hear some more details during Mr. Anderson's report on what we heard from the TC CTC, which is always a critical part of our process. Thank you. Any questions for Kyle on that report? And there's no questions, so we'll move a little bit south. John North and the Oregon report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, the Oregon public salmon uh, hearing was held uh, in person the night of Monday, March 20th. Uh, we had representatives, uh, including myself, representing the council rep for Oregon. We weren't able to have a National Marine Fisheries uh, Service rep at this meeting. We also had um, Chris Germain, German from uh, U.S. Coast Guard, Kit Dahl from council staff, and Cassie Lehman from uh, the salmon technical team on hand, uh, Oregon staff. Uh, the attendance was kind of low. We only had uh, about 13 participants attending, not including the folks that I mentioned and other agency staff. Uh, not a lot of testimony. I think we only recorded six, uh, six different uh, individuals testifying on the commercial side of things. Kind of mixed bag. There was comments on the timing and the benefit of coho in the troll fishery. Uh, we heard uh, one one vote for alt one and one for alt alt three. Uh, there were some comments on weekly Chinook landing limits in the north of Falcon area and then uh, flexibility for a uh, port of landing. On the recreational side, there was two votes for maximum opportunity. Uh, we did have a vote for a one fish daily bag limit during the fall, September and October for a little more conservative uh, angle. And then there was the comments on the benefit of rolling over coho, um, unused sport coho to the troll fishery, some discussion on that. Uh, we also had some various other comments um, after the meeting adjourned about inside recreational fishery uh, uh, guides, uh, impact of uh, Alaska hatchery production on West Coast stock productivity and and uh, other other. Uh, more inland related issues. Thank you, John. Any questions on the Oregon report? And there's no questions, so we'll, I will turn to Chair Gorelnik to give us the report from the California meetings. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hassamer. Uh, yes, we held a hearing uh, in Santa Rosa, California on Tuesday, March 21, um, during a pretty violent storm, indicating the gods were angry with our salmon situation. <laughs> um, aside from myself, we had Ms. Shannon Penna from the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, Lieutenant Devin Syke from the Coast Guard, Ms. Robin Elke was there uh, for council staff. And we had uh, all the other um, California uh, Council representatives, Bob Dooley, Marcy Uremko, and Corey Ridings were also in attendance along with two members of the SAS, uh, George Bradshaw and John Atkinson. Um, and we had a number of members uh, of the agency staff from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, following my opening comments, Ms. Uremko uh, provided a PowerPoint presentation summarizing the uh, salmon forecast, conservation objectives, and estimated impacts. Um, we had about um, 50 people in attendance at the meeting. It was very well attended, far more, far, far better attended than I had expected. We had 14 um, folks coming forward to provide testimony, uh, four from the commercial side, and 14 from the recreational fishery, uh, primarily uh, party boat captains. Uh, from the Golden 
Agate Fishermen's Association. Um, the commercial trail folks supported a full closure, uh, and the uh, for the most part, the speakers on behalf of the recreational fishery also supported uh, a full closure. One uh, testifier uh, sought a 10-day season. Um, comments throughout from both sectors uh, focused on the need for change in management and or water management, salmon management and or water management. A point was made that we don't control the water and the only knob we have to turn, as Brett Carmos has said, is uh, hooks in the water. Um, there was some comments that we sh we should not we should be looking also at the San Joaquin River salmon stock in addition to the Sacramento River salmon stock when it comes to establishing seasons. Um, and then additional comments were made that expressed appreciation for the SAS members and the hard work and time that was spent uh, dedicated to representing the ocean salmon fishery participants and the businesses that support them. That's the summary of my report. Thank you. Any questions for Chair Gorelnik on the report of, on the California hearings? And I don't see any questions there. So again, thank you very much. Um, that completes the summary of the public hearings. We'll next move to the report from the U.S. section of the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Mr. Phil Anderson will give that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, direct your attention to um, a memo under this agenda item from the Chinook Technical Com Committee dated uh, March 29th. Uh, the Chinook Technical Committee resides within the Pacific Salmon Commission. It's comprised of about 35 individuals. It's a bilateral um, committee uh, made up of uh, uh, scientists from, from both Canada and the United States. Our two U.S. co-chairs are Milo Adkinson and, and John Kerry. Um, the Chinook Technical Committee provided uh, the Pacific Salmon Commission by the way of this memo that is in, briefing, that is in your briefing book. Uh, the memo provides the commission with the results of the just completed calibration of COB 2304 of the Pacific Salmon Commission Chinook model for 2023. The calibration provides the 2023 preseason abundance indices for determining the annual catch limits for the Northern British Columbia Troll and Haida Gwaii Sport and the West Coast of Vancouver Island Troll and Outside Sport Aggregate Abundance Based Management Fisheries the calibration also provides the abundance indices required for determining the 2022 postseason annual catch limits for all three uh, AABM fisheries, including Southeast Alaska, um, Cape Suckling to the Dix Dixon entrance, known, known as the SEAC, as well as Northern BC and West Coast of Vancouver Island. It's important to note that the Pacific Salmon Commission adopted a new multivariant model in conjunction with a 17 tier uh, that you'll see in appendix uh, table A1 on February 16th, 2023 to determine the preseason annual catch limit for the Southeast Alaska AABM fishery for 2023. Uh, this multivariant model utilizes the Pacific Salmon Chinook model uh, preseason AI, as well as the catch per unit of effort that comes from the early winter power troll fishery in District 113 of Southeast Alaska for stat weeks 41 through 48, that, and the one year ahead projected AI from the prior year's PSC Chinook model calibration. The CTC is providing to the commission um, by way of this memo, the results of the completed multivariant model analysis for 2023. Um, the memo uh, has been provided to the Pacific Fishery Management Council's STT and other 
uh, managers uh, in the South from state and tribal uh, management entities so that they can update the inputs for the three northern fishery areas. Uh, and as um, Dr. O'Farrell indicated, um, the information that we have in our updated impact sheet includes uh, those updates. I did want to uh, uh, thank and commend the CTC for completing this work on schedule. Um, we were expecting it to have it by April 1st, and as you saw, we got it uh, March 29th, and it represents a lot of work and a lot of coordination between a lot of the scientists from the two countries, including our state, federal, and tribal entities uh, on the United States side. So, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, that completes my report. Thank you, Phil. Are there questions for Phil on the, the Pacific Salmon Commission report? And I see no questions there. So that will take us on. Uh, we do have a, a report, no written report, but a verbal report from the North of Cape Falcon uh, forum and either and or both Kyle Addix and Joe Oatman, whichever one of you wants to go and Kyle Addix, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll start off and um, Mr. Oatman may have things to add. As the council knows, we have a pretty extensive public and co-manager process that goes on um, leading up to the March um, council meeting, continuing through March and up to the April council meeting and actually continues all through this week as we work out all the details of inside fisheries, as we try to link those up with ocean fisheries and make sure we meet all of our management objectives for the Columbia River, coastal Washington and Puget Sound. Um, as we heard from the STT and our first glimpse of some of the inside Puget Sound Chinook modeling, we know we still have work to do there, making sure we meet all of those um, ESA objectives. We know we'll have work to do with the um, package that might get ad adopted later today, particularly for Thule Chinook in the Columbia and working on inside outside fisheries there to make sure we meet our ceiling there. Um, so just no recommendations, but I'm sure I'll be asking the council's patience as we work our way through this week and try to um, come up with fisheries that meet everyone's needs and meet all of those conservation objectives that we have to meet at the end of the week. Thank you, Kyle. Joe, anything to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. No, I, I think uh, what uh, Mr. Addick just laid out there was uh, sufficient. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Any questions on the North of Falcon process? And there are no questions. So again, thank you for updating us on that. Uh, that will take us to our management and advisory body reports. And we will start that off with, uh, there is a CDFW, California Department of Fish and Wildlife report. And I believe Grace Easterbrook will be delivering that. Ah. Welcome, Grace. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item E2E, supplemental CDFW report one. California Department of Fish and Wildlife's report on in-season salmon management measures. At the Council's March 2023 meeting under agenda item D3 to identify management objectives and preliminary definition of 2023 management alternatives, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended that the 2023 range of alternatives developed for analysis include a framework that would allow the ability to manage California commercial and sport fisheries in season consistent with the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management, Management Plan <clears throat> in order to keep catches within forecasted projections of harvest and or impacts. The utility that would be gained by employing use of in-season measures has become apparent in recent years as California commercial ocean harvests have considerably exceeded preseason projections of ocean exploitation rates and catch, which may be a contributing, contributing factor in exceeding Endangered Species Act consultation standards, falling short of predicted harvests in other sectors, and under attaining expected escapements. In-season fishery management tools exist that can help assure that catches will remain within those projections, including vessel-based uh, vessel -based limits, bag or landing limits, area closures, time closures, or adjustments to season dates. 
The recommendations in this report build upon those oral remarks and on written recommendations provided by CDFW to the council at its November meeting. CDFW notes that although the 2023 se salmon season alternatives developed during the March meeting and approved by the council for public review did not include any California sport or commercial ocean fishery openers for 2023, the final preferred alternative adopted by the council at this meeting will likely include a number of season openers in April or May of 2024. Those openers and the regulations prescribing and defining the associated management framework would be published as part of the NIMPS annual management measures rule that is expected to be effective from May 16th, 2023 through May 15th, 2024. Once new stock forecast information is available, these pre-scheduled springtime openers would be reviewed by management entities and advisory bodies at the council's March and April 2024 meetings. <clears throat> and routine in-season consideration would be given as to whether adjustments to those start dates or measures are warranted. Ocean and river fisheries are planned based on expected performance in terms of both effort and harvest and with expe expectations that fish designated for escapement will escape. However, in postseason reviews of ocean fishery performance over recent, recent seasons, there has been better than predicted performance of the California commercial troll fishery, which catches between two and three times higher than preseason predictions. Prior to re the recent five years, high catch rates might suggest that there are more adult fish in the ocean than the forecasts indicated. However, contemporarily, no other metrics suggest the abundance of California stocks is higher than predicted, quite the contrary. California ocean sport fishery performance, in-river fishery performance, and realized escapement to the Central Valley and Klamath Basins have not met preseason predictions, and in many cases has fallen well short of preseason expectations. A substantial concern to CDFW is that California's largest Chinook salmon stocks have consistently failed to attain the fishery management plan's minimum escapement goals. Sacramento River Fall Run Chinook escapement has failed to meet the conservation objective of the minimum of the goal range of 122,000 adults in the last six of eight years. Klamath River Fall Chinook escapement has failed to meet the conservation objective for natural area adults in the last seven of eight years. <laughs> Moreover, repeated and significant exceedances of the age four Klamath Ocean impact rate cap of 16% have occurred. The consultation standard established to protect ESA listed California coastal Chinook. As NIMPS re references in its March 2023 guidance letter, in season management tools are expected to assist with the meeting preseason projections and therefore with meeting preseason projections and therefore more likely to achieve conservation objectives. CDFW is also mindful of the role of, pre of the preseason process where stakeholders and agency representatives are using the best available scientific information to negotiate sharing arrangements and other agreements surrounding fishing opportunity, considering the priorities of individual fishery sectors and coastal communities and when and where fishing opportunity is most valuable. Meanwhile, there is inherent cultural and intrinsic value of salmon resources to citizens, states, and nations that must be also considered. When preseason projections of catch or adult escapement are not realized, there are real costs and consequences to the fishing communities and sectors who are depending on that catch to materialize. And when predicted escapement fails to occur, there are real risks to the cohort, though, to the cohort those spawning adults were expected to produce. In season management or in season management can help ensure that these expectations, which underlie the fishery planning negotiations between sectors and interests, and which culminate into the final alternative, will stand a better chance of coming to fruition. Projections of total mixed stock catch in California's commercial and recreational fisheries become available for each year during the preseason process and are derived from exploitations of outputs. Um, from both the Sacramento and Klamath harvest models once season dates are selected. Those projected catches would be the basis of comparing with near real-time catch information as it becomes available in season. For the commercial troll fishery, CDFW recommends defining vessel-based landing and possession trip limits pre-season with the ability to modify in season. Trips would be prescribed for a defined fishing period uh, as an example, the fishing period might be weekly, 
Thursday through Wednesday, like the limits used in Oregon and Washington's fisheries, or, or it might also be set as a total for fishing periods of consecutive days when the fishing is open that may be less or more than a week long. The vessel-based landing and possession limit or number of remaining open fishing days in the season could be reduced, including fishery closure, if current catch estimates exceed preseason expectations. The initial trip limits would be part of the management measures recommended by the council to NIMS for adoption and federal regulation. The season dates for which vessel trip limits would be established would be informed by the salmon advisory sub panel and would be evaluated by the salmon technical team and published in analyses available in pre two and pre three. These initial limits would then be subject to in season review and reduction if needed as catch or other information becomes available. <clears throat> For recreational fisheries, CDFW recommends the ability to modify the bag limit or fishing season dates in season to keep catches within preseason catch projections. CDFW is evaluating the use of sampling procedures similar to methods employed by CDFW in coordination with NIMS and other co-managing co agencies for the Pacific halibut, for Pacific halibut and constraining ground fish species to assess the recreational fishery in season to determine if season in-season action in the recreational fishery might be necessary. CDFW and NIMS are continuing to evaluate the feasibility of this approach for the salmon fishery and will complete that work prior to the preseason planning for the 2024 salmon fishing season. CDFW would rely on information collected in its ocean fishery monitoring programs to collect catch and effort data in the ocean sport and commercial fisheries as they are happening. CDFW's Ocean Salmon Project employs up to 20 dedicated seasonal employees that monitor the commercial and charter boat fisheries at 13 and 15 primary salmon sample sites, respectively, when seasons are open. Additionally, CDFW's California Re Recreational Fisheries Survey, or SURFs, is a comprehensive statewide creel census monitoring program that involves deployment deployment of up to 70 seasonal samplers who monitor launch ramps and charter vessels to collect catch and effort information on salmon and other species taken and targeted in recreational fisheries across the state of California. To ensure the most real-time information is available, available for use in season, CDFW further recommends that the federal salmon regulations specify that any California commercial landing receipt with salmon listed shall be submitted to CDFW within 24 hours, similar to the federal requirement for Pacific bluefin, tuna, sablefish, and fish land as part of the West Coast ground fish individual fishery quota program. CDFW appreciates the coordinated work with NIMPS in recent months to develop both the mechanisms and the potential regulatory language necessary to make in-season measures available for use beginning with the 2023 to 2024 annual measurement measures, management measures. Thank you. Are there any questions on the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report? I don't see any hands, so again, thank you, Grace. Thank you. That our next report is the SAS report. And welcome up to the table, Richard Heap. And I suspect you will have someone to support you there. Button on this that I can, that I can find. There, is it on now? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Council for this opportunity for us to meet in person. Uh, this is the kind of year where that's pretty vital for us to have real intense open discussions. As is usually our job, we're doing our very best to bring you our uh, recommendations and advice on the season that reflect both uh, the work of the SAS plus what we've heard from the public. We bring that advice to you this year, particularly with the acute awareness of the impact of the social and economic implications that this season has. This is a pretty serious year and that's a tough year, but here we are. So with that, I'll bring up the commercial uh, folks and we'll start with our recommendations. We're reading from agenda item E2E, the SAS report one. And so traditionally we'll begin with Washington. 
my name is Ryan Johnson. I will read the uh, North of Falcon commercial alter uh, alternative. The overall non-Indian attack of 85,000 Chinook and 200,000 marked coho. The commercial troll attack of 42,500 Chinook, 32,000 marked coho. <clears throat> For fisheries prior to May 16, 2023, <clears throat> please see the 2022 management measures which are subject to in-season action in the 2023 season described below. May 1 through 15, please see 2022 subject to in-season changes. May 16 through the earlier of June 29th or 28,300 Chinook, no more than 7,500 of which may be caught between the U.S.-Canada border and the Queets River, no more than 6,570 of which may be caught in the area between Leadbetter and Falcon. May 16 through June 21, open seven days a week, then an open period of June 22 to June 29. <clears throat> Between the Canadian border and the Queets River, a landing possession limit of 70 Chinook per vessel per week on a Thursday to Wednesday week, as well as a period of June 22 to June 29th. Landing limits will be evaluated weekly in season. In the area between the Queets River and Ledbetter Point, there's a landing and possession limit of 150 Chinook per landing per week and will be evaluated weekly. Between Leadbetter and Falcon, the landing and possession limit of 60 Chinook that will be evaluated weekly. <clears throat> All salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches. When is it estimated that approximately 50% of the overall Chinook quota or any Chinook sub area guideline has been landed in season action may be considered to ensure the quota and sub area guidelines are not exceeded. If the Chinook quota is exceeded, the excess will be deducted from the all salmon season. In 2024, the season will open May 1, consistent with all preseason regulations in place in this area and sub areas during May 16 through June 30th, 2023, including sub area salmon guidelines and quotas, weekly vessel limits, except as described below for vessels fishing or in possession of salmon north of Leadbetter Point. This opening could be modified following council review in March or April in 2024. The summer season is July 1 through the earlier of September 30th or 14,200 Chinook or 32,000 marked coho open seven days a week all salmon Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches coho minimum size of 16 inches all coho must be marked no chum retention north of Cape Alava Washington in August and September landing and possession limit of 150 marked coho per vessel per landing week Thursday to Wednesday and those will be evaluated weekly in season. When it is estimated that approximately 50% of the overall Chinook quota has been landed in season action may be considered to ensure the quota is not exceeded. An impact neutral non-selective coho fishery may be considered through in season management actions later in the season. Turn the page and do the remainder of the table there. For troll fisheries north of Cape Falcon, mandatory closed areas include the salmon troll yellow eye rockfish conservation area, and the Cape Flattery and Columbia control zones. Vessels must land and deliver within 24 hours of any fishery closure. Vessels may not land east of the CQ River, east of Tongue Point, Oregon. And then the remaining paragraphs are uh, delivery requirements and call-in requirements when changing between regulatory zones at the Leadbetter and Queets River lines. That completes North of Falcon. Thank you. We'll pause there and see if there are any questions on the North of Falcon commercial. And I don't see any, so I'll let you proceed. So the um, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, September 1 through October 31st, open seven days per week, all salmon through the earlier of September 30, we're reaching 10,000 non-mark select coho quota all salmon except coho thereafter, coho minimum size limit of 16 inches total length and Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. All vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. See gear restrictions and definitions. Beginning October 1, open shoreward of the 40 fathom regulatory line. No more than 75 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week. Coho quota of 10,000 non-mark selective, no more than 75 coho allowed per vessel per landing week, which is Thursday through Wednesday. Vessel limits may be modified in season. 
All remainder of the Mark Select Coho quota from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain recreational fishery may be transferred in season to the Cape Falcon to Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain troll fishery on an impact neutral basis. Recreational fishery needs to be prioritized for this transfer. In 2024, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size of 28 inches total length. Gear restrictions will be the same as 2023. This opening could be modified uh, following council review at its March 2024 meeting. For Humbug Mountain to the Oregon, California border, the season is closed. All right, thank you. I'll just pause for any questions so we don't stack too many uh, on that section. But I'm not seeing any hands, so uh, we'll move on to the next. All right, thank you. Um, my name is George Bradshaw. I'll be reading the California Commercial Troll Alternatives. Um, continuing on the same page, the Oregon-California border to Humboldt South Jetty, California KMZ is closed. In 2024, the season will open May 1 through the earlier of May 31, or a 3,000 Chinook quota, Chinook minimum size limit of 27 inches total length, landing possession limit of 20 Chinook per vessel day, open five days per week, Friday through Tuesday, all salmon except coho. Any remaining portion of Chinook quota may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the next open quota period. All fish caught in the area must be landed in the area within 24 hours of any fishery closure. Uh, and prior to the fish and prior to fishing outside the area, um, we'll move down Humboldt South Jetty to Latitude 4010 is closed. Uh, Latitude 4010 to Point Arena, Fort Bragg is closed. In 2024, the season will open April 16th. For all salmon except coho, minimum Chinook, or minimum Chinook size limit of 27 total inches in length, uh, sea compliance requirements and gear restrictions and definitions. All salmon must be landed in California and north of Point Arena. Landing possession limits may be considered in season. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 24 meeting. Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco, closed. In 2024, season will open May 1 for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit, 27 inches, total length. Um, same gear restrictions as before. Landing possession limits considered in season. Could be modified in the March or April 24 meeting. The point raised to Point San Pedro, fall target area, is also closed. Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border, the Monterey zone, is closed as well. Um, in 2024, the season will open May 1. All salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit, again, 24 or 27 inches total length. Uh, sea gear requirements, restrictions, definitions, landing possession limits will be considered in season as well. Um, this opening could be modified at the council under council review of March or April, 2024. Thank you. Any questions for George on that section of the coast? Marcy Remco. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Actually, my question is for Richard in light of George's proposals. Um, I guess I was hoping maybe you can speak to the recommendation regarding the uh, Chinook weekly trip limit from um, Humbug, or I'm sorry, um, Falcon to Humbug, um, sept the fall fishery from September through October 31st. As I recall, the three alternatives that were under consideration, I think you had a maximum of 100 Chinook per uh, week in alternative one and then uh, down to zero in alternative three. So um, maybe you can talk to us a little about um, your initial recommendation here and the uh, amalgamated alternatives of uh, 75 Chinook. We discussed uh, at length that and we initially started with a hundred fish limit and thought that in the interest of uh, trying to reduce impacts, we would limit that to 75. 
That's also why we brought the fishery inside of the 40 fathom curve in October was to get us inside to focus on those coastal Chinook that we're trying to uh, intercept uh, and focus that fishery in there. Uh, follow up, Marcy. Yes, thank you. And so in your assessment and, and your efforts here um, to tailor this uh, fall fishery accordingly, what um, what did your analysis show uh, regarding projected impacts to Sacramento and Klamath fish? I don't recall off the top of my head the exact number, but they're small. We're, we're not anticipating creating a large credit card with this fishery. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Before they, these gentlemen leave the table, I'll look for further questions on the package of commercial troll measures. And I don't see any, so um, that will complete that section. And uh, Richard, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. We'll bring up the recreational folks. And with that, we will begin in the north with Washington. Good morning, Vice, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. My name is Dave Johnson. I'm the Washington Sport Rep. I'll be reading from page eight. Overall non-Indian tack of 85,000 Chinook and 200,000 marked coho with the healed adipose fin, recreational tack of 42,500 Chinook and 168,000 marked coho. All retained coho must be marked. Buoy 10 fishery opens August 1 with an expected landed catch of 40,000 marked coho in August and September. U.S. Canada border to Cape Alava, the Nia Bay sub area, will open June 17th through earlier September 30th or 17,470 marked coho for sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 9,490 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all except all salmon except no chum beginning August 1, two salmon per day, one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin. An impact neutral non-selective coho fishery may be considered through in-season management action later in the season. Beginning August 1, no Chinook retention east of the Benilla Tatouche line during council managed ocean fishery in-season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within the overall Chinook and coho recreational tax for North of Falcon. Cape Alava to the Queets River, La Push sub area will open June 17th through earlier September 30th or 4,370 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 1,590 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum beginning August 1, two salmon per day only one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin. In-season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within the overall Chinook and coho recreational tax. An impact neutral non-selective coho fishery may be considered through in-season management action later in the season. It will also open October 3rd through earlier of October 7th or 150 Chinook quota in the area north of 4750.00 north, south 480000. Fishery may be closed if extreme freshwater temperature and or flow events occur in the Quileute Basin in September. Chinook only, one Chinook per day. Queets River to Ledbetter Point or the Westport sub area June 24 through earlier September 30th or 62,160 mark coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 18,750 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a heel adipose fin. An impact neutral non-selective coho fishery may be considered through in-season management action later in the season. 
Ledbetter Point to Cape Falcon, Columbia River sub area, June 24th through earlier September 30th, or 84,000 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 12,520 Chinook. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more of which one may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a yield adipose fin. Again, an impact neutral non-selective coho fishery may be considered through in-season management action later in the season. And that concludes my North of Falcon. All right, thank you. I'll just pause briefly to see if there are any questions on that piece. And I don't see any hands, so I'll let the microphone move down. Good morning, Vice Chair, members of the Council. Uh, Mike Sorensen, I'll be reading from page nine. Cape Falcon to the Oregon-California border, Mark Select Coho Fishery. June 17th through the earlier August 31st, or 110,000 mark coho quota, open seven days a week, all salmon except Chinook, two salmon per day, all retained coho must have a healed adipose fin. Any remainder of the mark select coho quota may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the recreational and or commercial trail quotas for the non-select coho fishery from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, Recreational needs will be prioritized for this transfer. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, September 1st through October 31st, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, or all, all salmon except coho, except as described in the non mark select coho fishery. One fish per day, Chinook minimum size limit 24 inches. In 2024, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit 24 inches. Uh, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, the non-select coho fishery, September 1 through the earlier September 30th, or a 25,000 non-marked select coho, open seven days per week, may be modified in season. All salmon, two salmon per day, only a one which may be a Chinook. Moving on to page 10, Oregon, California border, or no, that's not me, so <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right. Keep going. No, I'm done. I'm done. I'm All right. Done. We'll just pause there for a second to see if there's any questions on that section. And I don't see any. Oh, excuse me, John North. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Just uh, one, I guess, a clarification from Mr. Sorensen on the Cape Falcon to Humbug September to October. I, oh, it, yes. Did uh, did the staff in this recommendation? I think it includes shoreward of the forty fathom line, and I I didn't hear you mention that. So that I think that's new. Yes, Mr. North. Thank you. I I did uh, leave that one out. Uh, beginning October first, uh, we will be moving inside of the forty fathom. All right, thank you. Further questions? And I don't see any. Thanks, Mike. And we'll move the microphone down. Good morning, Council staff. Jimmy Arnell, California Sport Rep. I'll be continuing reading from Table 2 on page 10. The Oregon-California border to latitude 4010, the California KMZ closed. In 2024, season opens May 1 for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length. Bag limits may be modified in season, and this opening could be modified following council review at the March or April 2024 meeting. Moving south, latitude 4010 to Point Arena or Fort Bragg closed. In 2024, season opens April 6th for all salmon except to coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length. Bag limits may be modified in season. This opening could be modified following council review at its March or April 2024 meetings. Point Arena to Pigeon Point for San Francisco closed. In 2024, season opens April 6 for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, one sh or Chinook minimum size, 
24 inches total length. Um, bag limits may be modified in season. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2024 meeting. Pigeon Point to US-Mexico border, Monterey closed in 2024. Season opens April 6th for all salmon except coho. Two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size of 24 inches total length. Bag limits may be modified in season. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2024 meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Questions for Jim on that set of recommendations. And there is no question, so we'll move on to the last piece. All right, thank you. Next, we have two tribal reports. The first one will be the Columbia River tribal report. Uh, I don't have anybody down, so I'll turn to Joe Oatman for an introduction. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So we have the supplemental tribal report two uh, that will provide by the representatives from the uh, Columbia River Treaty Tribe. So I understand that uh, Mr. Eric Holt will be uh, providing that report. And he has uh, uh, James Marsh um, and Stuart Ellis uh, in attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So good morning. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, I'll let you go ahead. I, I believe, Mr. Holt, you'll start it off. <clears throat> Hello. <clears throat> I was told uh, when I come down here and by one of our elders before I showed up to make sure I stood and give my report because that gives respect to the table and to who I'm addressing. So out of respect, I will stand to give my testimony to you this morning. Tatsmewe <clears> Oikolo, <throat> which means good morning, everyone. Um, good day, members of the council. My name is Eric Colt. I'm an enrolled member of the Nest Fish Tribe. I'm the chairman of the Nest Fish Tribe Fish and Wildlife Commission and also a commissioner for the Columbia River and Tribal Fish Commission. I'm here today to provide a statement on behalf of the four Columbia River Treaty Tribes, the Umatilla, the Warm Springs, Yakima, and Nespers Tribes. As the council prepares to finalize options for the 2023 ocean fisheries, our tribes are just beginning to celebrate the new fishing year. We honor these, the return of salmon with ceremonies and feasts in each home, also known as longhouses, as the fish move upstream. These ceremonies maintain the connection of our sacred foods and water, which are critically important to our spiritual needs and provide the basis of our efforts to restore, rebuild, and manage our fish. The states of Oregon and Washington have increased difficulty in projecting impact rates in some lower Columbia River fall fisheries, which can result in imprecise management. In reviewing ocean model outputs of lower Columbia River fisheries that share ESA limits, with the ocean fisheries, it is clear that lower river hatchery fall chinook management can indirectly impact our treaty fisheries. This is because lower, rif, li, lower river mixed stock fisheries also harvest upriver stocks that we depend on. Mark selective fishing in, in the fall has made estimating stock composition more difficult and less precise due to the many different unclipped stocks that are released. Uncertainties in estimating LRH impacts also affects ocean fisheries because they share the same ESA limit. One possible action that may help resolve some of these issues would be to implement a lower river test fishery in the fall. The states, the states have used tangle net gear for test fishing for many years in the spring. Test fishing is also already a part of the Puget Sound recreational fishery management. The test fishing provides data on stock composition and clip rates that can ground truth creel surveys. Test fishing provides an opportunity to collect genetic samples that would provide much better estimates of the stock composition. The cost for a test fishery would also be moderate and would benefit both ocean and in river fishery management. The Columbia River Treaty Tribes urge the states of Oregon and Washington to consider a lower river test fishery in the fall. We also remain very concerned about marked selective fishing in areas where there are large numbers of sea lions. 
We're concerned that the released fish may be easier for sea lions to prey on compared to fish that have not been handled and released. As we continue to track the process this week, we remind the council that our main objective is to ensure that our treaty fisheries can access as much of our 50% of the harvestable surplus as possible and meet hatchery broodstock and natural escapement needs. We expect both the ocean and non-treaty Columbia River fisheries to not adversely affect our access to as much of our share as the harvest as possible. We do not want to be faced with an unfair share of the conservation burden. Please consider these goals as you work through the season setting process this week. That's the out, yeah, you cool. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Holt, Mr. Marsh, Mr. Ellis, Virgil Moore? Eric, thanks for your comments about uh, being sure that the lower river fisheries take care of our upper river stocks. I just wanna reiterate my awareness of that on your behalf, thanks. Good to you. Further questions on this report? And I don't see any, so I want to thank you again all for coming up and giving us that report. That's yeah, yeah. Thank you. Next, we'll have a, a report from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. Mr. Casey Baldwin is here to give that. Welcome, Casey, and go ahead and get started whenever you're comfortable there. There we go, thank you. Um, <clears throat> before I re read the report, I just wanted to give a quick update on a request that the Colville Tribes made uh, at, at your previous meeting uh, in March, uh, which was to uh, give an update to your Habitat Committee and, and the Salmon Advisory Subpanel on the, the restoration work uh, to, re to uh, reintroduce salmon upstream of Chief Joe and Grand Coulee. And uh, I, I was able to uh, get some time on the Habitat Committee meeting yesterday and provide that update and I appreciated that. Also got some time to talk with uh, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel um, and give them a brief primer on that. And then uh, we discussed some options for, for a presentation in the future at one of their future meetings. So I just wanted to express my appreciation of those subcommittees um, and uh, you know be willing to work with this on, on short notice and, and with the busy schedules. So appreciate that. <clears throat> um, my name is Casey Baldwin. I'm a research scientist with the Colville Tribes Fish and Wildlife Department. And I'm here today on behalf of uh, Chairman uh, of the Business Council of the Colville Tribes, uh, Jared Erickson, uh, to provide this report on item E2E, the Supplemental Tribal Report Number 1 from the Colville Tribes. <clears throat> the importance of salmon to the, to the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation in the Upper Columbia region cannot be overstated. As one of the many tribes who have federally recognized fishing rights, for runs managed by the PFMC under the Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act, the Colville Tribes has participated in this forum uh, for the last several years. Colville Tribes participates in many salmon recovery forums, are actively engaged in salmon restoration actions, and have commented in a variety of venues due to the importance of the fisheries and how the salmon occupy a central role in the lives of the tribal members. The Colville Tribes have been salmon managers on the Columbia River since time immemorial and we still are today. Salmon fisheries form a key part of the regional culture, history, and identity, and provide tremendous social, spiritual, and economic benefits. The Colville Tribes includes 12,000, uh, <clears throat> includes 12 tribes and approximately 10,000 enrolled members. The reservation is located at the terminus of anadromous salmon migration on the Columbia River in North Central Washington. Our waters include both healthy runs of summer fall Chinook and sockeye salmon, as well as ESA listed stocks of spring Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. The salmon runs that used to support our, our subsistence and cultural needs were nearly lost and are currently a fraction of what they were, due in part to, due to the construction and operation of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee dams. The hatchery operations from Chief Joseph Hatchery uh, produce approximately 3 million Chinook for the system when at full production. The PFMC ocean fisheries intercept the salmon produced on the Colville Reservation throughout our traditional territories and in the Upper Columbia River uh, and from our hatchery. We do not have a commercial salmon harvest because the basic ceremony and subsistence needs of our tribes are not fulfilled by contemporary salmon runs. The Colville tribes have 10,000 members and the current draft Chinook allocation for 2023 is well under one fish per person for the entire year. 
Although the run forecast this year is above the recent average, more work still needs to be done to continue this improvement. Therefore, we urge you to be conservative in our approach to, to setting the salmon seasons for 2023. The Coville Tribes recommends you adopt ocean harvest alternative number three for North of Falcon. We make this recommendation because of the uncertainty involved in salmon forecasts, because you will not know if your forecast is too high until the fish pass Bonneville Dam. If there's an overharvest in the ocean, then the Columbia River fishermen, including the Colville tribes, will have to make all the sacrifices on harvest in order to meet broodstock needs and spawning escapement. We've been following the unfortunate situation with the stocks in California and empathize with the tribal and non-tribal fishermen who are making sacrifices while those stocks are struggling to meet escapement objectives. It's an important reminder that we all must take care of the land, the water, and the animals if we want them to take care of us. The Coville Tribes will continue to meaningfully participate in PFMC, PFMC process and look forward to continuing to work together towards our common goals. We appreciate the opportunity to provide a perspective to the PFMC and look forward to continuing to work with this body to ensure the fisheries for the future. Sincerely, uh, Jared Michael Erickson, Coville Business Council Chairman. Thank you. That concludes our report. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Baldwin on that report? And I don't see any hands, so thank you very much, Casey. And I just want to note that we received our Habitat Committee report today, and they were appreciative of the update that you gave them. So very good. thanks for taking the time to do that. Thank you. That completes all of our reports and takes us to public comment. We have two signups are on the screen here now. So we will start with Brian McLaughlin followed by George Bradshaw. And Brian, if you can hear us, go ahead and begin. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. Chair and council members, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I fish primarily out of the port of Garibaldi, Oregon. Thank you for allowing me once again to provide comments uh, this morning regarding salmon management, this time regarding the adoption of the 2023 Ocean Salmon Season Management Measures. My comments concern the proposed recreational salmon seasons for the Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain Management Area. In connection with my oral testimony, I've submitted written comments, which include a letter from the North Coast Salmon and Steelhead Enhancement Fund, a 501c3 organization which is dedicated to raising funds and investing in fishery enhancement projects along Oregon's North Coast. Through the years, this organization has contributed and leveraged millions of dollars for projects to help both fish and fishermen, including the purchase of equipment for hatcheries and broodstock programs, renovation of boat launches, and funding of habitat restoration activities. I also bring to the Council's attention several comments submitted through the Council's ePortal that support my comments today. First, I urge, urge the Council to support and adopt the season set forth in Alternative 1 for the Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain area. These seasons are designed so that the fishery targets abundant stocks of Columbia River hatchery coho, hatchery and wild Oregon coast coho, and Oregon coast chinook, while meeting applicable conservation objectives and having very minimal impacts on the constraining stocks of Sacramento River and Klamath River fall chinook. Second, in order to be consistent with this uh, salmon fishery management plan, I urge the council to revise alternative one so that unused quota from the recreational mark selective segment of the coho season be transferred first to the non-mark selective segment of the recreational coho season in sufficient amount to assure completion of the scheduled season, including for marine, estuary, and freshwater areas. Any remaining quota after assuring completion of the recreational season may be transferred to the commercial sector. Um, hearing the SAS just previously, I believe that uh, a change reflecting that has been made to the proposed alternatives. And finally, I ask the council to adopt some form of meaningful open recreational salmon season for the Falcon to Humbug area from May 16th to the opening of the coho season, which is uh, scheduled for June 17th under the alternatives. I suggest our traditional Chinook retention regulations or other creative options, such as a one fish daily bag limit, mark select Chinook retention, a 30 or 40 fathom depth restriction, or a bubble fishery around the entrance to Tillamook Bay, where we target returning hatchery spring Chinook. The council should note that there have been a number of comments submitted requesting a bubble fishery around Tillamook Bay, 
and that this management measure has been used before. I realize that uh, this would occur primarily in state waters, but I want to make sure that it uh, is an option available to the state should it uh, be practical to open something like that. Here again, expected impacts to Klamath and Sacramento Fall Chinook from any fishery options mentioned above would be exceedingly low and have no material impact on achievement of the conservation objectives. Thank you for considering my comments. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. McLaughlin on that? And I don't see any hands here, Brian, so thank you very much for taking your time. Uh, next, we'll move on to George Bradshaw, who is here in the audience. Welcome, George. Hello. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair and Council, staff and public. Um, I wasn't intending to make comment at this point, um, you know, and went and put my name in now. And my comment is going to be towards uh, Council and CDFW's uh, report. And, you know, what, I, what I'm going to speak to is a request to fix the problem that we've been here for the last handful of council years. Um, you know, I personally have made testimony multiple different times bringing up these issues. Um, and to me, what I see is, you know, we come here to the council and advisory bodies and public weigh in on, you know, potential salmon alternatives. And we use you know, from start to beginning or start to end of a process of, you know, forecasting uh, harvest models and then escapements. And then we start again, we go to the beginning again the next year. And, um, you know, I find it difficult to believe and, and I'm, I'm fearful that if we don't start from the top and address the issues from start to finish, we're not going to have the finished product that we're looking for. Um, you know, and if we go looking into just the harvest aspect, which I heard from CDFW report, um, it isn't going to come to the, the realized conclusion that we're, we're hoping for of escapement goals because we haven't addressed the forecasting issues. Um, you know, and, and I guess I don't see on agenda throughout this council period, but what I'm requesting is that, you know, we take the time and we accept the workload that is going to be necessary to to fix this issue um, so that we're not constantly sitting here talking about this. And I understand modeling, you know, has inaccuracies. It varies, um, you know, but specific, specifically to the Central Valley, um, you know, there's changes that I believe that we could address in the forecasting to get to a better overall forecast, which is going to create the beginning of a better process and then we could get into harvest and I'll be the first one again to raise my hand and say that, you know, harvest needs to be accounted for. We need accountability, um, you know, commercial fleet as well. And, you know, in-season management may be a thing of the future um, to help get there, but we have to ensure that we have the right targets, the right forecast. And, you know, if the forecast isn't correct, we don't know what really to harvest, um, you know, and, and, when we come to in-season management, um, you know, there's a lot of different routes that we could take. And, and I feel that if we address on this end the harvest model, so that the harvest model is accurate in the sense of what we're actually putting into it for time area place, um, you know, I, I again volunteer my time to try to help this issue um, with what I know of my fleet and the way that they act and the way that the fish react when we're on the water. Um, you know, I believe that we could again address that harvest model and have it more accurate so that we ultimately, you know, have a better outcome. Um, you know, and, and those comments, my, my, my final, I guess, ask again is, you know, that we, we take the time and accept the workload and build the, the, the groups of individuals to assess the process so that we have the outcome that we 
are all here talking for. Um, and you know that I've made and others have made public testimony comments through throughout the last handful of years trying to address um, you know these issues so that so that we're not back in this situation you know in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for George on his testimony? Yes, Susan Bishop. Thank, thank you, George. Appreciate that. I was curious if you had uh, thoughts about what forum that might um, be addressed in. So the council has a lot of experience in work groups that address things like, you know, pretty soon we'll be talking about conservation objective updates, methodology review, different kinds of forums that different uh, types of work are done in. So I was curious if you had given some thought to where this workload might fit. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ms. Bishop. Um, you know, I, I would assume, again, you know, this isn't my field of expertise. I'm a fisherman by trade. Um, but that being said, I would I would assume that we there would be work groups, um, you know, put together to address them specifically, you know, the Sacramento forecast model and the harvest models, um, you know, and, and I, again, would, would just be making an assumption there. Thank you. Further questions? Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, George, for your testimony. Um, past few cycles, I'm, I'm thinking back to some tasks that we assigned to the STT to take a look at base period use in the harvest models and to see if any adjustments were appropriate that might help us do better in terms of forecasting harvest. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, maybe I'd be interested in hearing um, what your thoughts are. I, I feel like we've put a fair amount of uh, energy into those exercises and done quite a, a deep dive look to see what improvements um, might be made to those uh, harvest models. But maybe you can elaborate a little bit on recommending um, additional um, examination of the harvest models. Yeah, I'm, um, thank you, Marcy. Are you asking specifically for my thought on what we think we could do differently or my my thought on why what we've done so far hasn't worked? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Since since you offered, I'll take you up on both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, well, you know, to start with the the latter, um, you know, and, and I do appreciate um, council and and staff, um, you know, trying to to do what we had in our in our means of addressing the issue as we work through the process, but ultimately and, and unfortunately, you know. Once we get all of our information and our data, we jump right into our first council process. Um, and there isn't a whole lot of time to analyze that information and, and address it. And then what I see from where I sit, which is outside of here, um, you know, then we look back and see how it worked. And, you know, we, we make our best shot at addressing that, um, you know, but unfortunately it, it hasn't worked. And I think, you know, moving forward, we have the opportunity now to look back at what we've done, right, from historically the way that it was and then the shortened time frames which you spoke of, and we can assess now, you know, the reality of what happened and how it did or didn't work, and we could use that information now moving forward to, again, address that so that we have the fix, and, and ultimately, you know, what I see on the harvest side specific to um, the commercial fleet is, you know, we try to shorten the time frame to get a reality on, you know, fleet dynamics that potentially and, and was thought of that has changed from historical ways that I guess we fished, right? And we were trying to get a real time view by shortening that data set. But unfortunately, you know, we got rid of a lot of the historical data out of that model and we got rid of a lot of the historical areas that we fished and unintentionally, you know, it changed time area spaces of, of value 
for where the fleet used to fish. Um, and then also unintentionally, you know, it, it, it blocked us into, instead of, you know, historically month long seasons into half month down into week size. And the model wasn't built or designed in my mind to capture those small block openers for a couple different reasons. One reason being, you know, it, you know, statistically, if there's a school of fish, say, and it's 10,000 fish or whatever it may be, and the you know, fleet goes out and fishes it, day one, they remove 3,000, day two, there's less. Statistically, catch rates are going to go down because you're removing fish, right? But then also that, you know, habit of what the fish do when the fleet's there is they, they disperse, right? It's prey predator instincts and they disperse. So then again, you know, you know, catch rates go down. And my point being is when we have these block openers, which we've gotten ourselves into because we have constrained fisheries, catch rates are high for the first couple days. And then as the fleet fishes, they go down. And then eventually they're going to realize that flat line, which the model was built on over a historical average, right? But it, it it's not capturing right now that traje trajectory of the opener before it realizes the flat line of, of catch rate. And, and I think that could be looked into. And I think we could probably look back again, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago of, you know, what we did and how we tried to fix it. And we could back model into that reality. And I think if we went back and looked into the last handful of years, once we've gotten into those small block openers, we'll be able to see the data from what we did. And it's going to show exactly what I just explained that, you know, catch rates are pretty high for the first couple of days. The fish don't know we're there. They didn't know we were coming. We haven't been there. And then it goes down and then we get like a flat line of, of, you know, contact rates. And I think if we adapted that model um, to address that issue, we are going to have far better accountability for harvest. Sorry, that was long. Okay, thank you. Further questions? I don't see any hands, so thanks again, George. Yep. Thank you. That completes our public comment and takes us to council discussion on action on this one. Before we get to that, we've been at it for an hour and 20 minutes. I just want to uh, ask the desire of the council, do you want a short 10-minute break as opposed to a long 10-minute break? Uh, to get ready to come back or keep going forward. I'm seeing some indications to keep moving forward. Is that correct? All right. Then we'll op I will open up the floor for any discussion on this item. Look for any hands to start that discussion. Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just going to ask if um, Mr. Remco might give a little bit more context to the um, document that, uh, or to the report that um, Ms. Um, Easterbrook gave a little bit earlier in terms of kind of the intent of that and how that might fit into some of the discussions that, that we've been having over the last several months. Thank you. Marcy, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Susan, for the question. Um, didn't have an opportunity to give um, some kind of context remarks in advance of Grace presenting the report. But um, as she highlighted in the, the opening sections, uh, CDFW has brought um, forward to the council recommendations in past reports uh, back in November of 2022, and then also orally uh, during our March discussions uh, as we began um, developing our um, alternatives recommending that uh, we incorporate the use of in-season management measures into uh, the alternatives that we began developing back in March. Um, I note that the um, refinements and the alternatives, the SAS package that we have in front of us, um, clearly outlines um, on page six for commercial, um, the proposed use of in-season management measures uh, for California. Uh, C8G that references uh, landing limits in California may be implemented or modified 
to sustain season length and keep within preseason expectations. So um, the language in the package um, definitely reflects our intention and our request um, that we brought forward uh, during the discussions in March. Uh, similarly, page 11 of the package speaks to recreational measures and uh, that modifications may um, become necessary uh, to bag limits to um, sustain season length or um, <clears throat> achieve preseason um, expectations. So uh, we appreciate the addition of, of the language um, in the SAS package, um, and we look forward to it in the upcoming um, federal uh, regulations once um, NIFS has completed their development um, for this upcoming management year. Um, as we also note in the uh, CDFW report, um, looking back to the um, NIMFS guidance letter uh, from March, um, NIMFS indicated uh, to the council that you'll uh, be including the use of in-season management measures as part of the proposed action in the reinitiation on California Coastal Chinook. So um, you referenced that in your guidance letter. We, we agree um, that'll be a useful tool. Uh, so with all that, we just wanted to make sure that we put some flesh on the bones in a written report that was submitted to the council. Um, really, there's there's not much new uh, in terms of the, the, the concepts that were presented in the CDFW report here, but it does just add some additional flesh on the bones and, and put um, our previously um, made oral remarks into writing into the record. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Any follow-up, Susan? All right, thank you. Any further discussion on this topic? We've got lots of time, so organize your thoughts, or um, if anybody's ready for a motion, we do need a motion to adopt the tentative uh, salmon management measures for analysis. So I'll also look for motions too, if there's no further discussion. Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion for the council. I move to tentatively adopt the ocean salmon fishery management measures for non-Indian fisheries as presented in agenda item E2E, Supplemental SAS Report 1, dated April 1, 2023, for STT collation and analysis. Thank you. The language on the screen is accurate and as intended. Yes. I will look for a second. Seconded by Marcy Remco. Please speak to your motion as needed. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Maybe I'll just take a second to thank the SAS for bringing this forward and for bringing forward alternatives for the council back in March. I know the, the issues and degree of difficulty vary between years and between states, but the SAS always does a great job of um, coming to us, representing all the voices that they represent and putting things in front of the council to, to help us get our job done. So as always, thanks to that group for doing what they do. Um, as I mentioned during my North of Falcon recommendations, I know we'll have North of Falcon work to, to do both with ocean fisheries and inside fisheries to come up with final packages that meet all our conservation objectives, anticipate being back um, to the council at least a couple times this week with guidance to move us in that direction. But I um, think this is a good place to start. And I'm sure that the salmon technical team appreciates getting an assignment at this point of the day instead of into the afternoon, which was not how I expected it to work out today. All right, thank you, Kyle. Questions for the maker of the motion? And I see no questions, so I will go ahead and call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. We'll move forward and see if there's any other further motions. Uh, Mr. Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I believe Sandra has the motion. I move the council adopt for STT analysis the following Trudy Troll 
salmon management measure. That would be 50,000 Chinook and 60,000 coho. Uh, the alternative consists of a May 1 to June 30 Chinook directed fishery and a July 1 to September 15 all species fishery. The Chinook quota should be evenly split between the two time periods. Thank you, Joe. The language on the screen is accurate and as you intend. It is, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. I will look for a second, seconded by Kyle Addix. Go ahead and speak to your motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, so for uh, this particular motion, the coastal tribes have uh, been meeting and have come to agreement on what's reflected here uh, on the screen before us. Um, wanted to point out that the uh, Chinook option is the same as the alternative one. Uh, from the March meeting, uh, while the coho option uh, is between alternative one and alternative two uh, from what we um, uh, did back in March. Uh, this option for the treaty uh, Indian troll fishery management measures uh, is also based on the recognition um, of a slightly better outlook for the harvest opportunities, uh, as well as the uh, conservation concerns I do expect that throughout this week, uh, the coastal uh, tribes will continue to uh, meet and uh, discuss uh, this uh, matter, as well as continue their uh, co-management discussions with the state of Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Are there questions for the maker of the motion? And I don't see any questions, any discussion on the motion? I see no hands for discussion, so I'll go ahead and call the question on that one. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Joe. Is there further discussion or while you think about that, I'll turn to Robin. Is Are there other things we need to do here? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think you have uh, done your work under this agenda item. Um, we've covered a lot of topics uh, through it all, but in the end, we have ended up with some tentative uh, measures for both tribal and non-tribal ocean fisheries, and um, the STT will run those analyses and uh, come back tomorrow with that. But under E2, your work here is done. All right. Thank you, Robin. So before I pass the gavel back to our chair. I just want to note, I did hear some auditory disturbance from an electronic device to my left uh, during the course of this. Uh, I think, thank you very much. So I will pass the gavel back to the chair. All right, thank you very much, Vice Chair Hassemer for enforcing the Anderson rule. Um, that completes our agenda for today, but before we break, I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are quite ahead of schedule on our first day. Um, our Deputy Director and I have been looking at the agenda, seeing if there was anything we can move up. And as you know, it's hard to do that early in the meeting. We are unable to identify anything. So um, I think that would conclude the day as you indicate, Mr. Chairman. I would encourage any of you that are able to do work on agenda items upcoming later in the week to feel free to do so since we have a free afternoon, evidently. Um, other than that, just a reminder regarding the chairman's reception this evening at 6 p.m. right out here. All right, thanks very much. Well, I don't recall in my years on the council ever breaking this early, um, but here we are. So <laughs> enjoy your afternoon because we're going to need it for later in the meeting, I suspect.